Uh, your conference will now be recorded. Uh, so number one, this is being recorded. So this will be used as content later on our website. Uh, looking forward to sharing all of our best practices and more about irrigation and compliance in the hemp industry. So today, company. Uh, first of which, you're going to hear about best practices and Mike Dukes and Jordan Pace are on the phone. Mike Dukes is going to lead the conversation about best practices. And without further ado, I will hand it to him. Before I do, just a few minutes. Uh, this slide will be available after the presentation in the next couple of weeks. Also, Q&A. Um, sorry, I'm going to need someone. So if you guys have any questions, please make sure to put those in the chat box. Um, you can either send them directly to me or put them in the group chat so everyone can see them. Because oftentimes, if you have a question, many others may have the same exact question. And that also facilitates some of the dialogue that we're looking for because the ecosystem together may collectively be able to have a lot of input and solve problems in this area. So again, uh, that's another thing. And then also please mute your audio. Um, unless you are talking, uh, we will probably uh, mute these as well. But again, just use the chat box for any type of conversations. So without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Mike um, at a high level. Uh, here are the best practices in hemp growing. He's going to touch on all of these things. And uh, Mike, Duke, you want to take it over? Hey, Robin. Thanks for getting us started. So from, from my slides, I have a, are we going to load the other ones or are we going to stick with this one? We're going to load the other ones. This was just more of a, a precursor to what you'll be talking about in the next slides. Okay, fantastic. Do we want to get those up on the screen? Yep. And Please. so at a, at a high level, the slides you just saw were basically an agenda of what Mike will be talking about. One of the things that Mike always jokes about that he'll probably lead off with is that you often learn more from your failures than your successes. And he has decades of experience in the hemp industry, and I really look forward to hearing what he has to say today. Thank you very much. So Robin, do you have, do you want me, Mike, I shared to you with the as the presenter, or do you want me to share that with Robin for the slides? Robin is, are you in control of those or is it Jordan? I can do it. Okay. So I'll just get started. Um, the first one that you guys are gonna see is, choose your genetics wisely. So that's one, one of the largest ones that we look at, right? And partnering up with a company like American Hemp Ventures are certainly doing that. Um, we look for industry leaders that have been doing this for, for multiple seasons and have been applying best agricultural practices um, as well as, you know, good chemistry practices to produce good feminization rates and through progeny hunting and doing all that. We, um, we've aligned ourselves with American Hemp Ventures. The way that we see it is they could produce really good cultivars that are geared towards a multitude of, of, of seasons in the state of Florida, as well as other states and countries that we're currently wor working in. Um, we know that with your genetics, it's not only in your genetics, it's also in your, uh, your soil and your water. So I'll be touching on that here, you know, pHs and NPK values, miners, all that stuff. Um, another one is ongoing farm management, right? When you get up and going, how are you processing? Uh, how are you drying? That stuff is going to be handled on Matt Turner on the next slides, um, on this, on the next meeting, but I'll briefly go into, into a few things on that as far as past in, pathogen mitigation. So if I could get somebody to go to the next slide. Okay. So this is AOSCA certified seed versus pilot. Um, Light is going to talk about this more in compliance as that's something that they delve into more list of seed dealers. Uh, that's on the FDAC website. It's important to understand that even the best genetics will go hot. This is true. So we have to understand as a cannabis plant maturates, the cannabinoids maturate. 
So regardless of what, uh, what we can do to spray on it or, you know, what we can add to our dirt or amendments or anything, we can actually cause more harm in causing the stress by adding more fertilizers. So we've seen males go um, from females. We've seen females revert into hermaphrodites just because of too much nitrogen was added to our beds or the soil temperature got too hot. So we have to really watch out for, for those stresses. As far as um, if plants sit inside the field for any amount of days longer than what the cannabinoid uh, threshold is for that state, and I think we're all going under the 0.3 compliance, it's going to test hot. So people have to do their due diligence and do weekly checks. We use, I believe, it's ACS Labs. Other companies will use ACS or Waters or Green Scientific. But people will have to do their due diligence to stay compliant um, as the majority of hemp. If you just leave it go, it will test hot. Next slide, please. Here we go. Florida soil types. So I'm just going to touch on a few of these. There's a lot of mixtures and combinations thereof. The majority of soil that we grow in Florida, it's called Mayakin soil, which is, it's not soil, it's sand. So there is something called capillary exchange that I'm sure the Netifim guys will go into. By the way, they have awesome products across the board. Really recommend them. I've used them in three states um, with great success. Thank you. So Danny will cover that though. But basically what we do is we go in and look at what's in your soil and in your water. And we give you evaluations on your NPKs and what minor packages you would need based on what's bioavailable. You got to understand that you can have 2000 ppm calcium in your dirt. It doesn't mean it's bioavailable. Or if your water is coming out of a ditch, it's coming out of seven, eight. You know, you know there's pH, there's X amount of pounds of elemental sulfur to add per acre that we could re reduce that. So we work with Waters Agricultural Lab in getting our tissue samples based on what we're given with our water and our sodium absor absorption rate and what we're given with our soil. There's, there's things that can be catered by uh, fertilizers. Um, that uh, again goes in with irrigation. If you're having drip or pivot or floodgate, one of our farms in South Florida seepage. So we have to use like a 120 to a 200 day coated fertilizer. It's not like we can inject through our, our drip. So the fertilizer and fertigation, as well as um, fumigation, changes from farm to farm. I need everybody to understand that what will work good in North Florida will not exactly work good in South Florida. I'm doing samples. Okay. When we take our tissue samples, we take them weekly. They get sent out to Waters Ag. What Waters does is it gives us an analysis of our NPK, our nitrogen, our phosphorus and our potash, along with our R miners. And we will adjust the fertilizer mix based on that, on what the plant needs at any given time. Ongoing management. Okay, th this is a biggie. Spacing, because the plant is photosensitive, it is understand to, sorry, it's important to identify the daylight. So there's something with cannabis called critical daylight interval. And what this means is that, the closer we get to the equator, the less amount of daylight we get. So if we're cultivating in Colorado, we have a long spring. If we're cultivating in Florida, there's no spring. So our planting densities, J, our planting densities change based on being more equatorial or, or least equatorial. So more northern Florida, we get less dense um, in the summers. And in South Florida, we're finding out that we can do double to if not triple plants in the same amount of acreage because there is less daylight. So the plant photosynthesizes faster, so it doesn't grow tall. Um, so that's just something that everybody should be aware of. You don't wanna get in a situation where, you know, you're planting 6,000 plants per acre in uh, January, and you are, or sorry, in July, and you realize that all your rows are gonna grow into each other, and you're gonna have uh, powdery mildew and downy and all these other problems that you don't want. So that's, that's that. Feed your plants, build a fertilizer regimen and what you have in your soil. That goes back to taking um, aggregate tissue samples and sending them to Waters Lab or whoever your company uses, net, net if it uses somebody else. I'm sure everybody's state has, has a laboratory that will do their NPK miners and also their bricks. And that's mainly what we look at. Um, sorry, I'm at the airport. So there's another one as to walk your rows. It's super important to walk your rows. 
when we walk outside, guys. So it's super important to walk your rows. What we're finding out in the state of Florida, because it is so equatorial, we're not getting as much um, as much time as it takes for the males to maturate. So they're actually maturating two and three times faster because there is less daylight down there than when I'm growing in uh, Lake Katrina, New York, or when I'm growing in um, Willamette Valley, Oregon. So in, in these states that are more northern, you get more time to look inside your fields because your males develop slowly. In the state of Florida, we are region nine and 10. Since we are so equatorial, the males develop fast. We've seen them in three and four days drop pollen sacks. So you got to get your scouting team out there and best farm practices says teach the same scouting team to scout for pests and pathogens to scout for males. If they're already there doing it, it just makes sense. Um, integrated pest management. Okay, so this is not a novel plant, right? It's a plant. So a plant is a plant is a plant. Whether you want to cut it up and slice it any other way, it's the same. So the same bugs that are going to like peppers and eggplant and cane are going to like cannabis. So what's not on this list of aphids, mites, army worms, caterpillars, white flies, and thrips is every other bug that you're going to find on the squash, every kind of leaf miner. Um, there is every kind of fusarium. There is pink rot. There is um, blossom end rot, crown rot. There's, there's all these same pathogens. Uh, we at Greenpoint, and I'm sure Netizen and other companies, they like to look at it as we attack things biologically, you know. We have to always remember that with the hemp being a fighter remediator, it's going to it's gonna remediate those su substances that get a sprayed or be fed on it. So we have to be careful because we don't want those, you know, contaminants to translocate into our product. So we have to understand half-life of products and what we're going to use. But more so importantly, is it biodegradable? Is it, you know, EPA regulated? Is it regulated for food crops? Does it have an all-crops label? Just because it's got an all-crops label, it doesn't mean we want to use it. So when we when we target these pests and pathogens, we do them based on different states. Sometimes we'll get tobacco fusarium. Sometimes we'll have mites. Sometimes we won't have anything. So we go with regional distributors for both fertilizer, um, irrigation equipment, as well as what state allows what fungicide or biocide or pesticide, as well as fertilizers. Um, Florida is the hardest state to get into along with California and Oregon as they have the most stringent departments of agriculture. So if anybody has any questions on, you know, how to pathogens or biologics, they can add that to the chat. We can go over those. Um, as far as cannabinoid testing on a weekly basis, when your flower sets are about the size of your pinky, we like to say you get them tested every week. And as that maturation occurs, we can actually log that. And based on, on seasonable values, we should be able to tell you, hey, after your first season, you know, you could expect this if you fertilize this and plant this in that region for this amount of time. So we're trying to take all the work out of it for the farmer and mitigate all the problems. Um, that's all I got if anybody has any questions. Good morning, or good afternoon, wherever you're at. My name is Danny Sosby. I'm going to cover a little bit on the hemp production with drip systems, as we mentioned before. Uh, I am a CCA, worked with NetFM for 24 years now. I've uh, been involved in production agriculture for about 35 years. We're going to fly really fast today. Uh, once I can get this little screen to move, my next slide would be nice. Okay. Uh, we're going to look at hemp production on water requirements, water quality, soil fertility, land prep, and plant stress management. We're going to do it pretty quick because I've got about 10 minutes. And so if I go over something that you're interested in, my last slide will have my contact information on it. So if you want to give me an email or a phone call, I'd be happy to discuss it with you. So the first thing, I get a lot of calls and they say, some will call me and tell me they have a 60 gallon a minute well. Uh, how, much, how many acres of hemp can I farm? Well, uh, as a dealer, we'll get in, involved with this when you decide to grow. The dealer is going to design 
your application rate per day, and that's going to change depending upon where you're at uh, by climatic conditions. Um, and so I'm just going to pick, so you're in Florida and you have three tenths of an inch per day on, on evapotranspiration. So the dealer will decide to, to um, replace that three tenths of an inch on a daily basis. You may not have to, you may, you may never may never have to, but you have to design the system to match that ET uh, in order to, and that means that ET can be replaced on a daily basis, not every other day, not every third day, but on a daily basis. Um, so water quality will be the next, soil fertility will be the next, land prep, and then plant stress management. So let's get back to the PKT. So if you um, have a three tenths of an inch a day requirement, that's equivalent to six gallons a minute per acre. And here's, you, know, you can see the, the formula get there. So uh, your location may drive you if you are in Florida and you have sand, and I'm defining as sand, if I have a Leatherman in my hand and I drop it and it disappears, that's sand. Uh, it's, uh, if I have sandy clay loam, it's different. So three tenths of an inch put on at one time on a heavy sand like that won't stay around. So you may have to apply that three tenths of an inch three times a day with one tenth at a time. So the application procedure and process will come um, after the um, design rate or the replacement is, is uh, identified by the, uh, uh, the dealer. Um, now, so if you got your quality down or your, I mean your quantity down, you know what you have capability of putting out. We need to test that water for water quality. Is it surface water? Is it well water? Or is it municipal? Uh, surface water is going to have things in suspension in it. And the reason we look, look at this is you're putting out through drip. We can't put something through the dripper. That'll give us issues with our dripper. Uh, if, it in, if, if it is in solution, now something that's in suspension, we can remove with filtration. Uh, which then if take care of. If it's solution like sodium or nitrate or bicarb or something like that, the only way to take it out is RO, reverse osmosis, which is very costly. Or if it's something in the, in the something that can be treated or amended, then we, with that water test, we can figure out what to do to make it a usable water source. So you could be adding acids, oxidizers, microbes, settling ponds, a lot of ways to get around the water quality. So if you have your quantity, uh, establish your water quality figured out, uh, if you're going to test this yourself, generally I ask the dealers to do the test or whoever's working with you, but make sure I get a lot of tests sent to me that are run on municipal. I want a drip irrigation analysis, so I'm looking for pH, all the ones in this little, little uh, words on the, on the bottom side that give me issues with my keeping my dripper flowing and flows correct in the system. So get the proper uh, analysis run. You may, it's going to come back in all kinds of reports, but you're going to look at EC, which is how salty that water is. It's going to give you the total solids in it. The pH is important. SAR that was mentioned earlier, all the goods and the bads. So if you look across this water, the, the number that stands out is H, HCO3, which is bicarbonate. That means that water's hard. Uh, doesn't mean it's a detriment drip. It just means we can manage it with sulfuric and solubilize it. So that will tell the dealer or the agronomist you're working with, or whoever you're working with, uh, how to treat that water. This is this is something with in suspension. This is algae where you have ponds and you catch runoff and you have an algae bloom. Algae can be managed with chlorines and filtration. This is oxidized iron. So the water may come out of the well. This is a solution issue of a problem. Um, they come out of the well looking just like aquafina bottled water, but once it oxidizes, the iron falls out. So we can, if we can identify that and that's in the water sample, uh, we'll know how to treat that water as well. So once you get your water quality identified, then let's get into the soil fertility. Make sure that you're taking a, a, a soil sample. I like them 0 to 12, 12 to 24, and 24 to 36. That's optional. Um, but make sure that you take it, take it properly across the field but you, you know where your starting point is. The, you'll get us a report that'll have all kinds of reports uh, of, of NPK and those kind of things. Um, the, the, each laboratory will take a soil and they'll extract the nutrients in with different kinds of acids for extracting agents. Um, I lean towards uh, H2O and CO2 extraction because that's how what a plant does. But it doesn't matter, whatever you're using as a lab, um, let the, let the lab report and whoever consulting you're working with them read those reports and give you what the um, requirements for putting on uh, the nutrients should be. 
If you don't understand, always ask questions. So once you get your utility down, um, uh, make sure that you, you know, some, sometimes the land preparation, I don't know in Florida, I think this campus has been pushed only where it's agricultural uh, land. Uh, in other states in the last three or four years, people have started going into hemp and they've started with just an open pasture land, open fallow ground. So when they would just run a disc across that fallow ground, throw up a little bit of bed, slide some plastic on it with some drip underneath it, put a hemp plant out there and away they'd go and they'd have issues because the land preparation was not done well. So make sure that you're deciding your bed spacings, you know, get your cultivation done, uh, correct. If you're going to be mulch or, chemi or chemical lay-by, um, what source of fertilizer is going to use? Is it going to be organic uh, compost? Or are you going to use uh, litters or uh, local sources of fertilizer, dry materials, liquids? Get all decided upon with your consultant so you'll know when and how to put it out so that you get it done at the proper stage. And then once these decisions have been made, then the land prep can be done um, uh, accordingly. Because sometimes you want to put some of this stuff, maybe it's a gypsum or some it's, it's a, a compost that you'll put out as you're doing the land prep to work it into the, the soil the best. Um, this is an example. This this grower, um, there was this is a sandy clay loam. He slid it in bed shape, and then he came back and he knifed in his dripper line. The next pass will be where he'll slide it again and put his mulch over the top of it. Um, uh, that's one way. Most of the guys are just doing it in one pass where you're sliding it, you're putting your dripper line down, and you're putting your mulch over the top of it. Um, that, that's To me, that makes more sense. Uh, and this land here has already had, if you look where the dripper line is down the center, uh, underneath that dripper line, it used to be, this is an 80 inch bed, it used to be 240s and it had an open furrow. Well, he filled that furrow up with compost before he slid that over. So below that tape, there's a um, probably a six inch um, sphere or strip of compost beneath that uh, dripper line. So everybody can, you know, can utilize, he's, he happens to be real close to compost uh, location. Um, this is a, the machine that some of them are using to put in the tubing itself uh, with the mulch machine uh, behind it. Lots of machines, lots of ways of doing it. Just remember that all of this material, the plastic, the polyethylene tape, the mulch that you're putting out, um, all these materials are going to have to be picked up. So you're putting them out mechanically. And so if you go to pick them up and remove them, you need to find some kind of mechanical way of getting them out. Because if you don't, you don't have the labor uh, of picking up by hand. So uh, the thickness of your mulch that you're covering the bed with, you may find that spending another an extra $50 an acre for a little bit thicker mulch may pull easier mechanically than a thinner mulch that when you try to pull mechanically, it just tears and rips into the field because the last thing you want is to have lots of big pieces of black mulch, you know, flying in that field or all just up into small pieces. This is a machine that they use to pull up the uh, the thicker mulch. And so that's a good good way of, of uh, mechanizing it. And you may, there's there again, lots of different forms of machines. I just took certain pictures and sent them to you. So I'm not brand specific. The next thing is, is you, you guys are now gonna be growers and you're going to be paid for your yield. It's going to either be pounds of biomass or it's going to be um, uh, pounds of, of, uh, of crude that you've extruded from the biomass, whatever, but you're going to be paid. So yield by definition is, is plant genetic potential minus stress. Uh, uh, I'll say 85% of plant stress is grower induced by putting on too much, not enough, too early, too late, wrong variety, wrong planting date, you name it. Uh, we make all those kinds of mistakes. Um, lots of crops, say I'll just take a row crop like, you know, uh, cotton, for example, when you put a cotton seed in the ground, you have an eight bale potential. And so every time you add stress to it, you, you reduce that bale. So most people are yielding three and four bale cotton, five bale cotton, because they stress off three bales. The unfortunate thing for him people is if you stress it, you could actually increase the THC and make the field go hot and not have any yield. So uh, it's very important to watch your stress management. Um, that goes for plants and people, I guess, too, as well. Um, so you can only manage what you see and record. So I, I ask growers to be more proactive than reactive. So uh, it's very important to put soil moisture sensors out so you can get an actual reading of where that water is going uh, before and after irrigation so you can get ahead of the stress game. 
establish your field capacity so you know fill the cup up and then all your job to do every day is to refill the cup not to overfill the cup there's no no need if your cup only holds eight ounces to try to put 24 ounces in there because the other ounces past eight are going to run off and perk down and if they perk down they're going to carry down some of the fertilizers that you put on and uh, you'll, you'll have a waste of that so manage that watch your oxygen level is, is there at, at, at the same time um uh, plant tissue sampling was mentioned. I like tissue. I like petio. I like petio better, but petios have a tendency to tell me what's going on next week. Tissue tests tell me what happened last week. If you have a local lab that you can work with and you're able to pull a petio on a Monday, get it into that lab, they get a result Tuesday. You put your fertilizer, you, you fertigate the following day, Wednesday. Whatever we put out through the drip line in the soil solution will be in the plant sap within 18 hours. So you have a three day interval to redirect the plant. Also, the guys that are pulling those tissues or petioles will be able to tell you um, to speed up, slow down, because as you get to that, that maturation point that was discussed earlier, we do not want to over uh, fumigate or fertigate or under in order to control that stress. And so listen to these local guys. Um, on the moisture sensing, this is a great advantage of stress where you see early that the guy, the grower went to uh, way high that was flood irrigation and he went almost what, nine days before he irrigated again. So he went from a 36% moisture by volume all the way down to a 14%. That's too much stress on irrigation. This slide is where you really want to be. The, the man, this score does not deviate two points on his percentage of moisture. That's one less stress factor we can take out of, of that plant stress I was talking about earlier. So anything that I have gone over, any questions that come up, uh, contact, phone number, email. Um, you know, I can, this presentation, if I, if I broke it up into those five parts, could be a half a day presentation. Um, but time restraints, I hope that I got maybe pricked some questions. Anything I can help you with, please give me a call. And thank you for your time today. Thanks, Danny. Next up, we're going to have Light Townsend from Greenpoint Research, and he is going to present about compliance. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Light Townsend, I'm Chief Legal Officer at Greenpoint Research. Greenpoint is uh, headquarters here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We've got nursery operations in Fort Meade, Florida, a little bit south of Lakeland and uh, farming operations, which Mike Dukes is uh, our, our director of both in South and uh, North Florida. So just again, you know, keeping uh, time management uh, on a forefront, we've got an overview. We're gonna talk quickly about federal statutes rulemaking, Florida statute rulemaking, and then compliance moving forward for Florida farmers. As a disclaimer, no, no, no compliance or attorney would give a presentation without it. Materials in this presentation are intended for general overview. If you have questions, please do reach out to your attorney with any of those um, questions and or specific issues of, uh, related to your operation and your farm. From a federal perspective, just to give you kind of an overview, the 2014 Farm Bill was the first passed um, hemp statute that allowed for permitted production of hemp in state universities through what was what are called industrial hemp pilot programs. The authority of uh, the 2014 Farm Bill for this purpose was extended through September of 2020. So we'll have uh, continued research here through, the, through September. 2018 Farm Bill moved the industry from research to full commercialization and removed hemp uh, from Schedule 1 of the Controlled Substances Act this means that any cannabis sativa L plant with less than 0.3% THC can be grown uh, throughout the United States and uh, provided for the USDA to promulgate rules for cultivation and required the availability of crop insurance, uh, which was kind of a misnomer. We'll get into that here. So federal regulators, um, the USDA interim effective rule went into effect October 31st, 2019. Uh, this regulatory scheme provides requirements that all states who choose to participate in this industry and be subject subject to the 2018 Farm Bill must adhere to. Uh, this includes licensing requirements, maintaining information regarding the land, testing procedures, disposal procedures, and procedures for handling violations. 
The testing requirements for this material in the field are stringent and must be performed by a DEA certified laboratory. Currently, uh, in Florida, there's only one DEA certified lab, that's ACS Labs, and that's who we use for all of our THC testing. From an insurance perspective, DARMA announced in December 2019 that it would be rolling out a APH, or Actual Production History Policy Coverage, in 21 states. Unfortunately, Florida was not part of those 21 states, um, and this APH policy is different than uh, a, the whole farm revenue policy, which many farmers and uh, production farmers and production are, are used to. Um, the APH policy looks at actual production of the farm and ensures that production. Um, it is interesting to note that you must submit three years financials with uh, your application for the APH policy. Because Florida was not a uh, part of and did not have industrial hemp grown for three years prior to December of 2019, uh, we were not included in that. So we'll expect to see Florida included in the RMA uh, APH policy and hopefully whole farm revenue policy rolling out here over the next couple of years. Um, other federal regulators that matter to uh, hemp would be the Treasury Department, FinCEN, and the FDA. Um, from a Treasury perspective, a major regulatory burden uh, was that impact of banking um, for hemp producers in the past has now been lifted as of the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, Treasury Department, along with the Financial Crimes Network, or FinCEN, has uh, provided guidance to all banks um, that they should no longer have to file the suspicious activity reports for every transaction a hemp business engages in. This was the the large regulatory burden that banks were under previously as cannabis was seen under the Controlled Substances Act. So thankfully that's been lifted. You shouldn't have any issues with your current banking solution. Um, and if you do, you should definitely seek legal representation because they should not be denying you service uh, as of today. On the FDA front, the 2018 Farm Bill explicitly preserved the authority for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to regulate hemp products under the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. Uh, the FDA took comment with regards to CBD as well as other cannabinoids in 2019, but has not promulgated any specific rules or guidance uh, on those products yet. Uh, we're, we expect to see some guidance, um, maybe minimal, but really the FDA has fallen back on comments that said, or after comments were issued, they've fallen back into the position that we're, we're looking for producers and we're looking for people within the industry to provide the research uh, to allow the FDA to say yes or no to certain products moving forward. So it's incumbent upon the individuals in the industry to be able to actually uh, submit that research that they're doing to make it so that more products, more hemp products can be used uh, in commerce moving forward. From a Florida perspective, the main statutes that are in place are Florida Stat 1004-4476. This was enacted after the 2014 Farm Bill was passed in 2016, providing for uh, educational hemp pilot programs. Uh, initially, only University of Florida and Florida A&M University could participate. A 2018 amendment allowed for other state universities with agriculture, engineering, and pharmacy programs to participate. Uh, universities like Florida State, University of South Florida, University of Central Florida, and Florida International have all started programs and are continuing research uh, until the September till September of this year. Florida Stat 581217 is the commercial hemp law of the state. It provides the specific definitions related to the commercial production of hemp and noticeably makes it unlawful for the cultivation of hemp in the state without a license or permit issued by uh, Florida Department of Ag. Further, after receiving a license, it's necessary for that producer to grow certified hemp seed or cultivars that have been certified by a certifying agency or a university conducting an industrial hemp pilot project pursuant to 1004. The regulations that the Florida Department of Ag have issued went live this year. The department has uh, received hundreds of pages of public comment um, and reworked and republished the rules a few different times to meet both the public uh, discussion, but as well as the requirements of the USDA interim final rule. Um, it's important to note that there are multiple rules that impact uh, the hemp industry. Rule 5B 57014, I'll talk about here in a second, is the main rule that guides the state hemp program. Uh, there's different rules for 
um, sampling, seed standards, um, cultivars, and disposal, all of which you would be subject to when growing uh, within the state. So jumping into 57014. Uh, it provides that a license or permit from Florida Department of Ag is required for each plot of hemp cultivated. Again, this is a, a, a flow through from the USDA discussion, which identified that um, each cultivar is, each, each contiguous area of a specific cultivar grown is a plot, meaning that you could have in one contiguous field of 100 acres, 25 acre plots four 25 acre plots of four different cultivars. Um, it's an important nuance to understand because it affects your, not only your sampling, but also your uh, containment plans and your um, signage that needs to be up on, on each plot. Um, to provide a detailed description of each plot, so current requirements, you must provide a detailed description, land description, GPS coordinates, uh, including the address or the legal land description, GPS coordinates. Um, submit a full set of fingerprints for each owner, partner, officer, member, director of the business and or farm to Florida Department of uh, FDLE, law enforcement for the state. Uh, as part of your application, you have to submit an environmental containment plan to prevent hemp from spreading through ditches, natural waterways, or other drainage. This can be a area of fallow field, berm, or some type of uh, break within your uh, field to I, to stop any of that um, spreading. Uh, there's the need to use dedicated equipment uh, for the facility or plan to clean any equipment used on site of all debris before it's moved from the property. There must be submission of a transport plan that ensures that hemp is covered and moved in full containment um, from non-contiguous locations. If you are have harvested hemp and you're moving it from one location to the next, it has to be a, a fully contained um, for that, that movement. A waste disposal plan is necessary. Uh, what are the chemical or mechanical processes that will be applied to ensure that all hemp plants are rendered non-viable when discretion is required after a hot test? And then finally, a proof of an agricultural bond. A bond uh, must be obtained for each separate growing location over five contiguous acres in an amount of not more than 150% of the estimated cost for removing and destroying that hemp. So uh, on, once licensed, cultivators will be required to adopt certain operating procedures to stay compliant within the law. Cultivators may only use certified hemp seeds or pilot program approved cultivars or seeds. The difference being that uh, the AOSCA certified seeds go through a different uh, certification process. The pilot program approved seeds go through uh, a different certification proce process with the pilot program approval. Um, it's important to note that finding a OSCA certified seed provider or a pilot program approved seed provider is, is a necessary step for any farmer looking to grow in Florida. There are lists of, provide, of seed providers within the state, uh, those that have a seed license and a seed dis distribution license that can be found with, on, on the Florida Department of Ag website. Um, Moving on with uh, maintaining documentation for hemp varieties and certification for three years, it's important to note that identification of the varieties that you've grown and, and the ongoing growth of the, the ongoing uh, capturing of the documentation for three at least three years prior is necessary and should be part of your compliance uh, within your farm. Uh, only bona fide agricultural land can be farmed and should be working on field testing uh, I think Mike got into that pretty specifically, you know, thinking about the bloom stage of the plant. Uh, there's not mandated testing at the state level. There's only internal testing until such time as you have your uh, harvest test. And so you must provide Florida Department of Ag 15 days notice prior to harvest uh, that you are going to harvest. They will have a group that comes out. There's a specific sampling guideline that they use. It's provided by the USDA where they're taking specific amounts from certain areas, uh, combining that into one sample, and then sending that to a DEA certified lab. It's important to note the previous week samples that you are doing internally will not be used and submitted as your prior to harvest report. Uh, your prior to harvest testing must be done within the 15, 15 day timeframe that you alert the Florida Department of Ag to do so. 
Um, finally, something to note, the, the department will conduct random inspection of cultivation sites. The inspections will focus mainly on uh, the licensee's environmental containment plan, the maintenance of seed certification documentation, the THC levels within the plan, making sure those do, do not exceed 0.3% THC. Uh, there's going to be some light examination for pests and diseases, general compliance within the uh, hemp program statute 581.217, as well as the rule 57.014. So moving forward, what does this all mean? Um, it's important to stay connected to the interim, to the USDA rulemaking. The interim final rule is was uh, promulgated at, somewhat in a rush. They needed to roll something out uh, as part of to be able to allow for the federal program to uh, take off. And so it's important to stay in, uh, attached to that and make sure that any updates uh, that flow through to the states, you, you and your farm will be able to implement. Staying compliant at a, at a state level, make sure to only use uh, AOSCA seed or pilot program approved seed, uh, maintain your documentation and stay compliant with your containment and transportation plans, as well as posting signage at all access points to your plots. Um, again, keeping compliant, making sure to test your product every week uh, after it goes into bloom for THC percentages. Um, make sure to have a good relationship with your Department of Ag uh, inspector and stay on top of your prior to harvest notice. 15 days prior to harvest, you have to let them know so they can come out. Um, and then there are approved pesticide lists available on the FDAX website that uh, you should use within your farm. And uh, thank you for your time. That's, that's it from me have any questions or anything like that, move into Q&A. Thanks, Light. So I don't see any questions in the chat box yet. Yesterday we had several um, and they all kind of kicked in at this time. So if you guys have any questions for any of our speakers or um, just want to discuss other hemp related topics, please feel free to add them to the chat box. As a reminder, we will be here same time, same place, uh, one o'clock Eastern Standard Time on this webinar link. We'll be talking more about post uh, harvest tomorrow. So that will include topics like drying and storage and other things that are all post harvest. I have some compliance questions. Okay. Um, how about processing for farmers? Uh, what level of processing are we allowed? Can we bring it to crude? Can we distill it on site? So you need to be careful with regards to your hemp food establishment, which is one of those rules that uh, you know we identified. There's, there's a, a numerous number of rules, but uh, depending on what your end product is going to be used for, if you did take it to a uh, distal or isolate that was going to be used in some type of food manufacturing, you would need to be compliant with the food, hemp food establishment regulations. Um, you know, thinking about processing as a multi-phase, you know, multi-phase step-by-step uh, procedure, you know, uh, once you harvest the hemp and get it into a stable state uh, outside of the field after it's been dried, you're able to do that on site. Um, when you take it from the stable dried state into probably some of the other derivative products, uh, distillates, isolates, things like that, first phase crude, um, then you'll start running into and kind of bumping up again some of these other hemp food establishment uh, requirements. But as long as you're compliant with, with those rules, you should be fine to do everything on site. Okay, and the specific rules to uh the other THC in our state. I have um, looking in front of me. Um, it's the it's the DEA rules. They have um, it says subtitle G hemp production section two nine seven A definitions. Uh, hemp. Uh, the term hemp means the plant cannabis sativa and any part of that plant including the seeds thereof and all derivatives, extracts, cannabinoids. Now it gets interesting. Isomers, acids, salts, and salts of isomers, whether growing or not, with a delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol concentration of not more than 0.3% or 
on a dry weight basis. Um, what does that mean for delta-8 conversions uh, with a CBD? You could run with iodine. What does that mean for the delta-10 THC conversions? You can run from CBD with carbon. What does that mean for the CBN manufacturer in our state from a degrading acid reaction? And do you have any clarification on those rules specifically? So uh, I don't have any clarification specifically. I, I would say to definitely, before you start working uh, with some of the closer to uh, THC compounds, you should definitely get legal counsel uh, to look into it uh, from a further perspective. The way we think about it internally is Delta-8, um, you know, is, I, and again, I'm going to get out over my skis on this, but I, I believe that it's it's a derivative from one of the, or it's an isomer of Delta-9. I know that you can degrade CBD and CB, some of the other cannabinoids into these um, closer to THC compounds. Um, and if it flows directly from CBD, um, then you would think that it might not uh, fall under or fall afoul of any of the DEA regulations, but I don't feel confident at this point without looking into it further saying that, that that's definitely the case. It, it, uh, the, the main compounds that come out, CBD, CBG, CBN, um, when those are extracted directly from the plant, those should be all fine. If you're taking your mother liquor and uh, running it into some of these other isomers, acids, and things uh, that are closer to the THC uh, compound, uh, that's where uh, you know, my guidance is going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to defer to be more safe than, than, than up against the line. So I'm going to I, I defer to whatever the opinion of, of your attorney would be. All right. And how about on-site remediation with chromo? You can, you know, there's chromo media, chromatography media. Um, you pretty much, you know, load the powder in a column. You take your THC, you mix it with a solvent, you pour it down the column, and compliant juice flows out the bottom um, as a disposal plan versus destruction for non-compliant media, or I mean, not compliant biomass. Yeah, and, and so I have gotten some uh, feedback from Florida Department of Ag with regards to uh, the, and again, I'm thinking about uh, some of the mother liquor that might come out with a higher concentration of the THC. When you have uh, a derivative product that has higher than 0.3% THC, uh, they're suggesting, uh, they being the regulatory system, uh, a complete destruction of that. Um, that's going to be our best practices and our standard operating procedure moving forward until we get better clarity. Uh, I, I think the process you've described, again, I'd have to defer back or I'd want to defer to, uh, you know, your legal counsel. Um, it's not a fight necessarily that we're, we're looking to get into at this point, just because it seems like, um, while it is somewhat of a specific process, uh, you know, we're looking at, at larger amounts of CBD and CBG being extracted and just taking the mother liquor and having that as, as a destruction process uh, at, at this point. All right, well, thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. Happy to help. Are there any other questions? Okay, excellent. That must mean our speakers covered the topics really well, as I believe they did. So thank you so much for joining today. Again, we will see you tomorrow. Slides will be available online on the respective websites, and we will also be sending out a post-event survey sometime in the next few days. We would love your feedback on um, each of the three events and making sure that we can answer your questions. If you have anything we did not cover that you want covered, we are resources to you as well, um, so make sure you contact contact um, our teams just to make sure we are helping consult and helping you grow your hemp business. Thanks again for joining.